So first, let's talk a little bit about the spinal cord and its functions and the spinal nerves. Keep in mind, your spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, but spinal nerves are not. Ganglia are not. Nerves in general are not part of the central nervous system. They are part of the peripheral nervous system. So the purpose of, all right, or the functions of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves are essentially going to be a connection between the other part of your central nervous system, your brain, and the rest of your body. So I feel pretty confident that everybody knows at this time that sensory input information is going to come from the periphery receptors located all throughout. Let's talk about your skin, pain receptors, temperature receptors and whatnot. So that that, that information is gonna come from the periphery and then go towards the central nervous system, head up through all right, the spinal cord to the brain. And then motor output or motor information originates up in the brain and is going to then leave right, the brain and go out to the effectors. Now, depending on what type of motor output information, is it somatic motor output information, which has to do with skeletal muscle, or if it's autonomic or visceral motor information, that means it's going to go out to a gland or it's going to go out to smooth muscle or cardiac muscle. Right, and then, of course, we've talked about different types of reflexes a little bit here and there throughout the course, but we're gonna talk about some of the spinal reflexes. And these reflexes, like the name says, spinal, having to do with spinal cord. The brain's not included in that. We'll talk about some of the cool characteristics of a spinal reflex here. So this should look familiar to everybody, All right? We saw this in lab, and this is essentially kind of showing you our pathways, right? To and from our spinal cord. So you remember, sensory is in the back, motor is in the front. So the blue colored neuron there is a sensory neuron. And so there's two types of sensory neurons, somatic sensory neurons, which is going to bring in what type of sensory information. I'll even make it a multiple choice, two answer choice question. Is it conscious or unconscious? Yeah, all right, so if it's somatic, it's conscious perception. So you can think of touch, for example, or pain, or temperature, or proprioception. That is all going to be somatic. And then the other type of sensory uh, neuron is going to be the visceral, also known as autonomic. And that's going to include things that you, can, you can't consciously perceive. If there is a stretch in your stomach, like when you started to drink a half of a uh, can of coke or whatever right your stomach will start to distend out you don't really necessarily are consciously aware of that but you have these stretch receptors in the lining of your stomach that are right so those are the two types where when we talk about the sense sensory neurons that come from the sensory um, receptors that we're going to see here in the posterior portion right, of our of our spinal cord enters in through the spinal nerve and then the spinal nerve branches, we have the posterior root, and then that has these several smaller posterior rootlets or dorsal rootlets that insert into the posterior or dorsal gray horn here. So then on the front here of the spinal cord, you'll notice the red neuron, that's a motor neuron. And so we have two types of those, right? We have our visceral or autonomic, which is gonna go out to our glands, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, things that we can't voluntarily control. Those are involuntary. Then the other type is gonna be the somatic motor neuron and that is going to have to do with skeletal muscle. So I just memorize somatic and skeletal muscle, visceral and autonomic is everything else. And so we can voluntarily control our skeletal muscle through the somatic motor neuron there. And the same type of thing, that motor neuron exits out of the anterior portion here of the spinal cord, depending on if we're dealing with a somatic motor neuron, that is gonna originate in the ventral or anterior gray horn, 
If it is autonomic or visceral, that will originate over here in the lateral grave. So it'll exit out through the anterior rootlets here, which will combine into the anterior roots and then form all right, and merge up here with the posterior root and form the spinal nerve there. Mixed nerve, spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. So when we're looking at these pathways that we're going to be discussing here, or right, what we call conduction pathways, we're going to see either these pathways are sensory or they're motor. So another name for the sensory pathways are going to be ascending pathways because, again, it's bringing that sensory input information from the periphery up to the brain. So it's ascending upwards. And motor pathways are also known as descending pathways because they're going to carry that motor output information, right, from the brain out, down and out to the body there. So you want to learn these common pathway characteristics here that you see listed on the board. First of all, all the pathways are paired. You're going to have a left and a right. Then you're also going to want to know the locations for the cells, right? So we're going to see here our axons are going to be located in the spinal cord tracts. The cell bodies are going to be located in ganglia. And we'll also see, all right, some of our cell bodies located in the gray horns there, depending on what type of neuron that we're dealing with. And we're also going to see some of those cell locations in the gray matter of the brain, like the cerebral cortex, for example. Also, some of the nuclei there. So as we learn these pathways, we're going to learn that these pathways are made are like a chain. So just like a chain can have several links in it, these pathways are going to have at least two neurons. So you're going to have a primary and a secondary neuron. Sometimes you'll have more. You can have a third one in there too, right? So you're going to have at least two neurons that are going to be in this chain. And then our final common characteristic is not all, right? But most of those pathways are going to cross over or what we call decusate. We all learned about decusation there in lab class, uh, last class, because we talked about the decusation located in, in the anterior portion of the medulla oblongata there. So most will decusate. And so that means that they're going to carry information to the opposite side of the body. We call that contralateral. Those that don't decusate or cross over, they'll stay what we call ipsilateral, which is the same side of the body. We'll talk about some of those pathways. Okay, so contralateral is the opposite because they cross over. Just like what we learned in chapter 13, that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and vice versa. <clears throat> but we're going to see with some of these pathways, we're going to learn that most cross over, but some do not. Okay. So let's start off with our sensory pathways here. So these sensory pathways, we're going to learn what the general sense receptors are. Okay, general sense receptors are pretty much the sense receptors that are located throughout the entirety of your body. You've got special sense receptors, which are primarily located in your head. Then your general sense receptors are located primarily throughout your body. But again, more on that when we get to chapter 16. So like I said before, you have two types. You got the somatic sensory and the visceral autonomic sensory. And so primarily when we're looking at the somatic sensory, think of conscious perception, things that you can consciously perceive. You can perceive touch, you can perceive pain, right? You can perceive all of those various characteristics. So tactile receptors, those are touch, right? And then proprioceptors, this is what I was telling you about that spatial awareness that your brain has of your body in space, in relation, in relation to itself. So those proprioceptors, what we call them, are going to be located in areas of movement. So joints, what's around a joint? Muscles, what attaches those muscles to those bones that move the joint? Tendons. So we're going to see proprioceptors right around the joint, for example, in some of the joint capsules, but also in the muscles and tendons there. 
The visceral sensory receptors, this think of viscera, organs. So they're going to detect if there's anything changing inside of the organs. It might detect, like I said, that distension in the stomach. If you start to drink your water, your stomach starts to descend somewhat. And it starts to stimulate, all right, your nervous, not your nervous system, excuse me. It starts to stimulate your digestive system. You put food in there and whatnot. Um, if you're um, receiving, all right, uh, start to exercise, right, and your heart rate increases, that's going to increase your blood pressure. Well, you have stretch receptors called baroreceptors also in some of your blood vessels to accommodate for that increase in blood pressure because you're going to get an increase in blood volume that's associated with that. So those are some of the concepts that you'll learn in more detail when you get into 211, right? So somatic sensory receptors and visceral sensory receptors, which are what we saw here in the blue. That's what we're talking about. All right. So did I skip one? No, I didn't. Okay. So let's talk about some of these sensory pathways here. So we're going to start to break it down. We're going to, I'm going to basically explain to you, like when you go to touch something with your finger, the path that that sensory information takes from your finger all the way up to your brain. That's what we're going to do here. But I want to lay some of the basic groundwork here. All right. So somatosensory pathways, are going to carry information from your skin, muscles, and joints. Visceral sensory pathways are going to carry it from your viscera or your organs there. So like I said, okay, some of the common characteristics of these pathways are going to involve a chain, which is going to involve at least two or more neurons. So we have a primary, sometimes known as a first order. I don't really refer to it as first order. I call them primary, secondary, tertiary, if there is a third one, okay? So primary, secondary, and tertiary. So the primary is out in the periphery. And so that means that it is usually going to be affiliated with some sort of receptor. And if you recall, right, the, the neurons, the sensory neurons primarily that carry right, that somatosensory information are going to be what we call, right, the pseudo, or excuse me, not pseudo, uh, unipolar. I don't know if you remember that. You had the cell body. This is going to look awful. And then you have one process coming off the cell body, and it splits. You have one process going one way, the other process going the other way. Well, one process is going to go towards the receptor out in the periphery there, and then the other process is going to go into the spinal cord. <clears throat> so where do you think this cell body is located? Well, what's a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system called? Gives it the G. There you go. Nailed it. Good. Okay. A ganglia. What's the only known ganglia that I've ever talked about in this course? Death, that's right, you nailed it. Dorsal root ganglia, also known as the posterior root ganglia. So that's where these cell bodies for these first order neurons are going to be located. They're going to be located in the dorsal root or posterior root ganglion there. Okay. And so then the other part of that neuron is going to head into the spinal cord, right? And then somewhere along the way, it's going to meet up with its secondary neuron. And it's going to synapse on that secondary neuron. And we're familiar with what happens at synapses, okay? Chemical synapses, for example. All right. Then our secondary neuron, known as our interneuron, is going to receive that sensory input information from the primary neuron. And it's going to go to one of two places. It's either going to normally travel up to the thalamus, and synapse onto a third neuron, or it's going to go to the cerebellum. Because maybe this sensory neuron is associated with proprioception, and it needs to fine-tune some motor movement there. So you have two possibilities with the secondary neuron. It's either going to ascend further up towards the brain and synapse onto a third neuron, or it's just going to go right to the cerebellum and do something there. So the tertiary neuron is going to, normally it's the cell body is located in the thalamus. It's gonna receive that 
input information from the secondary neuron, that inner neuron there, and it is going to transmit that sensory input information to the somatosensory cortex. And we know where that's located, okay? That's gonna be the post-central gyrus, which is in the parietal lobe of your brain. That's where the somatosensory cortex is. So when you touch something that is cold or something that is soft or something that is rough, that information is gonna travel all the way up to the parietal lobe of your brain. And we're gonna trace out this pathway here. So this is kind of what I was talking about. So you can see here's the primary neuron. <clears throat> and so the primary neuron is carried out here to your finger. Here's your nail. All right, so the receptors that are there are the pad of your finger. And so whatever it is that you're touching is going to transmit information along that primary neuron, which is going to enter into the spinal cord, and it's going to ascend or synapse immediately. It varies, but it's going to synapse onto the secondary neuron. And then that secondary neuron is either going to go to the cerebellum or it's going to go ascend further up into your brain into the thalamus, because remember, what's the, the purpose of the thalamus? What's it do? What's its function? That switchboard operator, right? It's the relay center. It's gonna relay whatever sensory input information to the appropriate area. If it's visual information, it would go to your occipital lobe. If it was smell or if it was hearing, it would go to the temporal lobe, all right? But so this the, the secondary, a, a neuron will synapse onto the tertiary and that tertiary neuron, since we're talking about touch sensation, it's gonna transmit it to the parietal lobe there, to that post central gyrus there. And it's gonna transmit that information to the somatosensory cortex. So we're gonna get a little bit more into detail here because now we're gonna go through specific sensory pathways. And the first one here is called the posterior funiculus also known as the medial lemniscal pathway. And we saw the medial lem lemniscus when we were labeling the brain stem. So that should sound a little bit familiar with you. The medial lemniscus is gonna be myelinated, all right? It's a myelinated uh, sensory tract. It's gonna ascend up through the brain stem and we'll, we'll follow it through. So first of all, you wanna be familiar with what information travels on the posterior funiculus or the medial lemniscal pathway. Proprioception, touch and pressure, and vibration. Okay. So this pathway here utilizes three neurons. You're going to see a pattern here developing as I go through a couple of these pathways. There's many, many pathways, but we're only going to do a few, right? This is not a neuroanatomy class, but we're only going to cover a few. So the primary neuron is always, always out in the periphery somewhere, okay? It's associated with the receptor of some sort. And so it's essentially going to go from the skin, and in this case, it's going to go all the way to the brain stem. It's going to travel through the spinal cord, but it's not going to synapse on anything in the spinal cord there. So it's going to go all the way from your toe, maybe, to your fingertip, I mean, excuse me, from your toe or from your fingertip, but it's going to travel up your arm or up your leg into your spinal cord, and it's going to make its way all the way up to the brain stem here. So that means it's got to enter into your spinal cord through the spinal nerve, and then since it's sensory, it goes in through the back door, so it's going to go through the dorsal root or posterior root, and then it enters into the spinal cord. All right, we should... That's kind of what you're seeing here. It's coming in. It's going to ascend up, except it's not going to synapse on anything here. Well, actually, let me go. To, I'll show you the other picture here. I'll come back. Hold on. Let me just get through this part first. All right. Here's the thing. When it enters into the spinal cord, it's going to travel through a certain region of the spinal cord. Remember the three areas or white matter areas that we labeled in lab class? in last class, right? We had the posterior white column, the lateral white column, and then the anterior white column, right? Your textbook uses funiculus, interchangeable. 
So that's what we're going to see here. When that primary motor, excuse me, sensory neuron enters in, it's going to enter into the posterior white column, otherwise known as the funiculus. And so that posterior white column has two parts to it. Right? It has the fasciculus cuneatus or the fasciculus gracilis. Does this look familiar to you? Gracilis? What do you think that what did that what does that represent? What do you think that is from? It was a muscle located in your lower extremity. Right? So this is how you can remember, right, which area that that sensory neuron is going to travel through. If it's carrying information from your lower extremities or the lower portion of your body, it's going to enter into the spinal cord and travel through the fasciculus gracilis. If it's for your upper extremity or the upper part of your body, it's going to be the fasciculus cuneatus. Let me show you what those are real quick. So here's that primary motor neuron. Here it is coming in. It enters into the spinal cord. Here's that posterior white column or that posterior funiculus, and you can see, right, you have the left side and the right side. So the green represents the fasciculus gracilis, and the orange represents the fasciculus cuneatus. So if that information is coming from your neck, your trunk, your upper extremities there, it's going to travel in through the fasciculus cuneatus, and it goes all the way up until we get into the brainstem. I'll get into that specifics there and come back. So that first, that primary neuron enters in, ascends up through the spinal cord, and is going to synapse or connect onto the secondary neuron in the medulla. And that is going to be where it synapses with our secondary or our inner neuron there. And so from there, that secondary neuron is going to ascend through the remaining portion of your brainstem all the way up to the thalamus. And it's going to travel through right, this structure here called the medial lemniscus. And I told you that is a myelinated tr sensory tract. So it's going to appear white. And so it's going to travel up through that all the way to the thalamus. And then once it synapses there in the thalamus onto the tertiary neuron, that tertiary neuron is then going to head out to the primary somatosensory cortex located in the, in the parietal lobe of the brain. And again, it's going to be carrying any of those sensations there, touch, pressure, all right, proprioception and vibration there. So let's take a look on the picture here and kind of follow it through. All right, here's the primary neuron coming in. It enters into the spinal cord, depending on what area it came from from your body, will determine whether or not it's going to travel all right, or ascend through the fasciculus gracilis or the fasciculus cuneatus. But it's going to travel all the way up into the medulla oblongata, and it's going to, it's going to synapse onto the secondary neuron. So that synapse is going to be found in either the nucleus gracilis or the nucleus cuneatus. What's a nucleus in the central nervous system? In radio, we call this dead air. It's bad for business. <laughs> All, right. All right. A cluster of cell bodies is a nucleus. The reason why I say that is because I want to see. Now you can see that in action right here, y'all. You can see why there would be a clustering of cell bodies here. Why? Because there's synapses going on, right? You, you're going to be involving a cell body or cell bodies when there's synapsing going on. Presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron. Does that ring a bell? Chapter 12. All right, so that's what these nuclei are. Clusters of cell bodies because there's synapsing going on there. So here, all right, the secondary neuron is going to then exit out of the nucleus cuneatus or the nucleus gracilis, and it's going to cross over and decusate 
into that medial lumniscal tract there. And it's going to ascend up through the pons, through the midbrain. All of that is the medial lumniscal tract until it gets all the way up here to the thalamus, to the relay station, where it synapses onto the tertiary sensory neuron. And that tertiary sensory neuron is going to send, all right, that sensory in input information to the primary somatosensory cortex or the som somatosensory cortex, where that's where you've come to realization that you touch something or something's vibrating, your cell phone's vibrating, whatnot. All right, so keep that in mind. And I failed to mention this too, that the actual secondary neuron does cross over. It does decusate before it enters into the medial lumniscal tract. Okay, so that's the medial lumniscal pathway. Let's talk about another pathway. Look at the name, anterior lateral pathway. Okay, this is another sensory pathway. So let's see what it carries. It's going to carry crew touch, pressure pain, and temperature. And it's also going to use a three-neuron chain. Folks, I'll tell you, that there's going to be a pattern developing here. You'll notice it when I do this one, but I'll, even, I'll give you a heads up. The primary motor neuron is going to always start in the same place, out in the periphery somewhere. And guess what? The tertiary, did I say motor neuron? The primary sensory neuron right, is always going to originate in the same place, somewhere out in the periphery, in the skin, muscles, joints. And then the tertiary sensory neuron is always going to travel from the thalamus to all right, the appropriate area in the cerebral cortex there. So if you look, the primary neuron, where's it going? Uh, where's it coming from? The skin somewhere, okay? It could be your kneecap. It could be your elbow. It could be the back of your hand, right? It's starting off in the periphery. And in this case, this one now is not going to go directly to the brainstem. This one here is going to go into the spinal cord and synapse on something. So it has to take the same route. It has to enter into the spinal cord through the spinal nerve. And then it goes through the back door and enters into the um, the spinal cord through the dorsal root or the or posterior root there. And so it is then going to synapse onto the secondary neuron in the posterior or dorsal horn on the backside. That's where the secondary neuron is hanging out, our inner neuron. And so it is going to, of course, decusate or cross over. And it's going to go up through the spinal cord, up through the brain stem. And then it's eventually going to then come to the thalamus. And then it's going to synapse onto our tertiary neuron. And you know the story from there. Right? The tertiary neuron is going to leave the thalamus and it is going to go to the cerebral cortex, to the primary somatosensory cortex there. <clears throat> so you can kind of see a pattern. It's just you, some of the things that change is going to be where the primary sensory neuron is going to synapse onto the secondary sensory neuron. We saw for the medial lumniscal pathway, that synapsing occurred in the brainstem. For our anterior lateral pathway, this synapsing is going to occur in the spinal cord. And then it can take two routes. It can either take the front route or the side route. And I'll show you here. All right. Once it crosses over, it's either going to be in the front portion of the spinal cord or it's going to be all right, in the, the lateral portion of the spinal cord there. But notice the name here. Spinothalamic. Tells you where it's coming from and going to. Right. It's going from the spinal cord to the thalamus. Let the names help you out. So here you can see, same thing with our primary neuron. It enters into all right, the spinal cord through the spinal nerve, goes through the posterior or dorsal root, and then it's going to synapse all right, in the posterior or dorsal gray horn back here onto the secondary sensory neuron here. And so you can see this one over here, when it synapses onto that, it decusates, it crosses over, and then it's going to travel through the front part of the spinal cord. So we call that the anterior spinal thalamic tract. 
and it's going to ascend all the way up here to the thalamus, synapse onto the tertiary sensory neuron, and then it's going to direct that tertiary sensory neuron to the appropriate area in the cerebral cortex. And in this case, it's going to go to the primary somatosensory cortex. We can also see here that that primary neuron can synapse onto this secondary neuron. It crosses over and decusates, but instead of going to the front of the spinal cord, it goes to the side here in the lateral um, white column. And so it's going to travel through the lateral spinal thalamic tract. Same story. It, just, it ascends all the way up through the spinal cord, through the brain stem, and then all the way up here to the thalamus where it synapses onto the tertiary uh, neuron. And then that tertiary neuron goes to the appropriate area in the cerebral cortex there. So we call that the anterior lateral pathway. Three neuron chain, okay, carrying crude touch, Right, pain, temperature, right? All right, let's talk about the spinal cerebellar pathway. Spine and then cerebellum. So this one is going to go to the cerebellum, a little bit shorter distance. This is how I remembered it. So because it's a little bit of a shorter distance, this only has two neurons involved. But the primary neuron... It's going to be the same story that we talked about before. It is going to be out in the periphery. So it's going to go from the skin, right, from the receptors into the skin to the spinal cord. So it enters in through the spinal nerve and then it has to enter into the spinal cord through the posterior or dorsal root, where it's then going to synapse onto the secondary neuron in the posterior or dorsal horn. And the secondary neuron is going to ascend upwards. Here's the thing. You are going to see some, not all, some fibers will cross. That means contralateral. Some will remain ipsilateral or stay on the same side. So again, in this situation, we have two different tracks. So we have the anterior spinal cerebellar tract, and then we have the posterior spinal cerebellar tract. And then that secondary neuron ends up going into the cerebellum. So here is the sensory input information that it's carrying, proprioception. Body spatial awareness. How much a joint is flexing or extending or pronating or supinating. It's going to be carrying all that information there for you. All right, so let's take a look at the picture here. So here you can see, here's that primary neuron coming in, enters in through the spinal nerve, goes in through the posterior root or the dorsal root, and then it is going to enter into the posterior gray horn or dorsal gray horn, and it'll synapse onto the second secondary neuron. And so you're going to see that that secondary neuron can do one of two things. It can be ipsilateral. So that means it stays on the same side. So it synapses on the ipsilateral one. And then that ipsilateral neuron ascends up through the brain stem into the cerebellum. The other one is going to be, you can see the primary neuron comes in, same route, comes in to the posterior or dorsal gray horn, and then it is going to synapse onto its secondary neuron. In this case, this secondary neuron does decusate or cross over. So it crosses over, and then it will ascend all right, up through the brain stem and into the cerebellum there. <clears throat> All right, questions? I know this stuff's not terribly interesting. Okay. Just be grateful that I'm not going over all the tracks. We're only doing a few. We're going to switch over to the motor tracks, which are a little bit more interesting. All right. And then we'll make way. We'll get into the reflexes here. All right. So let's talk about the motor pathways here. All right. So now another name for motor pathways are descending. So that means we're going to start in the brain and we're going to go all the way out to the body's effectors. And in this case, right, we're going to talk about our skeletal muscles. 
right? So real quick, right? Primary motor cortex is in the frontal lobe. That's where the origination of right, your motor commands is going to start, right up there. So here for the motor pathways, again, same rule applies, y'all, for some of the common characteristics of our pathways. Right? You're going to have at least two neurons. So when we're discussing the two neurons in the motor pathways, we have an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. And so one of those terms should be somewhat familiar to you because remember in lab class, I was talking to you folks about the Babinski reflex. And I told you in an adult, if you get an abnormal Babinski reflex, you should immediately be thinking upper motor neuron lesion. So now we're going to talk about what the heck an upper motor neuron is. Right? And there's certain conditions that affect our upper motor neurons. I mentioned one of those being MS. Yeah, multiple sclerosis or an actual trauma to the nerve itself. Okay, so the upper motor neuron originates in the motor cortex. And so we're going to see, right, there's a couple places here that we're going to talk about, but the upper motor neuron can be in the motor cortex, the cerebral, uh, a cerebral nucleus, because there's more than one, or one of the brainstem nuclei. You probably don't remember this, but when we talk about brainstem nuclei, you should be thinking of cranial nerves, right? The cranial nerves, they originate, all right? Most of them will be in the brainstem and they'll be extending out of the brainstem there. So anyways, the upper motor neuron will then synapse onto the lower motor neuron. And so this is either going to be when we talk about a cranial nerve nucleus, maybe one of our nuclei that's in the midbrain or the pons or the medulla oblongata, or right, we have our spinal nerves. And so it'll synapse onto, all right, the, the upper motor neuron will synapse onto the lower motor neuron in the anterior gray horn. And that's gonna affect our muscles. Usually, it's going to excite the muscle. Okay, so let's talk about that. Here we go. Direct, also known as the pyramidal pathway. So this is going to be pretty much when you guys are writing, walking, even talking, like how your skeletal muscles are going to operate. So we're going to talk about that pathway from the cerebral cortex in your brain all the way out to the effector organs of your skeletal muscles. So this starts in the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe, which is going to be that um, pre-central gyrus. That's the anatomical term for the primary motor cortex there. So the upper motor neuron will travel down through all right, your white matter, which we see in the cerebrum called the internal capsule. Then they're going to travel through the midbrain there, the first part of your brain stem, through the cerebral peduncles. And then when we get into our spine, they're going to enter into what we call the cortical spinal tracts. And then they'll come down into certain levels of your spinal cord and they'll synapse onto the cell body of your lower motor neuron in the anterior or ventral gray horn. And then from there, right, that, that lower motor neuron will exit out of the spinal cord through the anterior or ventral root, and then it travels into the spinal nerve, and then it goes all the way to one of your skeletal muscles somewhere. <clears throat> it could be the muscles in your calf. It goes down through the sciatic nerve. You could go to the muscles in your forearm, go down through the median nerve. All right, but keep that in mind right, when we're talking about the direct pathway, it's a two neuron chain. Upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron. Upper motor neuron originates in the primary motor cortex in, in your anterior, or excuse me, into your, in your frontal lobe and the precentral gyrus there. It descends through the white matter of your cerebrum the internal capsule there, and it enters in the brainstem, right? 
and then it'll travel down into your spinal cord and travel through the spinal cord, right, through the cortical spinal tracts. Then it'll synapse onto the second, the lower motor neuron in the anterior gray horn or ventral gray horn. And then that lower motor neuron will enter out into the periphery there and then innervate your skeletal muscle somewhere. So we'll show you a picture. Real simple. This is the easy one. So you can see, here's your upper motor neuron originating in the primary motor cortex there in the frontal lobe. It descends down through the white matter and it'll start to go down through the brainstem there, through the cerebral peduncles of the midbrain, down through all right, the pons and the medulla oblongata. And it'll travel down through the white matter here of the cortical spinal tracts. And eventually it'll synapse onto the lower motor neuron here in the anterior or ventral gray horn, and then that lower motor neuron exits out of the spinal cord through the anterior or ventral root, then it meets up with the posterior root or the dorsal root, they form the spinal nerve, and then it goes out to the effector, out to the skeletal muscle. All right, so staying on our direct pathway here, we have our, remember, we didn't see any crossing over, did we? I want to talk about the crossing over aspect now. That's just a general, kind of this picture here, right? You can kind of see, I didn't tell you where it crossed over. Remember, there was two places where, all right, you can cross over or decusate. One of the places was where, do y'all remember? In the brainstem in the medulla oblongata, and the other places in the spinal cord. So we're gonna talk about those between the lateral cortical spinal tract and the anterior cortical spinal tract. So the lateral cortical spinal tract is going to decusate in the medulla, in the, remember those pyramids, those two bulges that sat right on the anterior portion of the medulla? If not, just go over your notes um, from the last part of chapter 13. And so once it enters into or, or crosses over, it will travel down in the lateral white column, also known as the lateral funiculi. And then that's where it'll enter in and synapse onto the lower motor neuron. So the fibers that travel through the lateral, the lateral cortical spinal tract is going to be responsible for the innervation of your limbs, right? For motions and movements that you're doing right now. If you're typing, or writing, right? So for skilled movements. The anterior cortical spinal tracts, right? They are going to be, hence the name anterior, they're gonna enter into the spinal cord in the anterior white column or the anterior funiculi. And then they're gonna to come to a certain level in your spinal cord. Could be at T1, it could be at L3, right? It varies, but they're gonna to get to a certain level in your spinal cord then they're going to decusate and cross over. And they're going to innervate axial skeletal muscles. And so we're all pretty much familiar with the axial skeletal muscles, right? Like the pectoralis major, the rectus abdominis, right? Anything that is going to be affiliated with your axial skeleton, which we already learned a bunch of those muscles there. All right, so that's the anterior cortical spinal tract. I'll show you a picture here. All right, so here we'll go one at a time, starting at the top. All right, left side of the body here. So you can see, whoops, this upper motor neuron here to the right. So again, same thing, starts in the primary motor cortex, descends down through the white matter. It's going to move through your brain stem, through the cerebral peduncles of the midbrain. And eventually it's going to get here into our uh, medulla pyramids here. In the front. And so here, this specific motor neuron or upper motor neuron is going to descend down and it's going to be in the anterior or front portion here. So that's why we call it the anterior cortical spinal tract. Also, because it decusates and crosses over at a, a specific level. This is actually showing you an involvement of an inner neuron, right? So in this case, we're having three 
neurons in our motor chain. Because I told you, right, you're going to have at least two. You're going to have at least two neurons in these chains here, or I should say two or more. So then we get that synapsing here uh, from the anterior uh, cortical spinal tract, and then that is going to exit out to the skeletal muscle on the contralateral side there. The other example you can see here for the lateral cortical spinal tract, that's this neuron on the left, same type of scenario, it descends all the way down, except when it gets to the medulla oblongata, it's going to cross over, right? And that's what we call the decusation of the medulla oblongata. There you see all, saw those fibers crossing over. And at this point, then it descends through the lateral white column or the lateral funiculus, and then it's going to synapse onto, in this case, again, you can see when we're talking about our lower motor neurons, we have an inner neuron being involved here, but it's already crossed over. So it synapses onto the lower motor neuron and that lower motor neuron goes out to the effector muscle. All right, real quick on a couple of these other motor pathways here. They're not really exciting. There's not really too, too much to talk about, but the indirect pathways here, this is what, Remember I told you, motor um, our upper motor neurons are going to originate in a couple different places, in the primary motor cortex, or they can originate in the brain stem here. So if you notice that up there, it says they take a more complicated route. I am not going to go over that with you guys, all right? I just want you to know the general all right, portions to this, all right? So the lateral pathway, I just want you to know right, what it's responsible for. Precision movements and tone in the flexor limbs, especially, all right, that's going to be helpful when we have certain reflexes there. The medial pathway also is going, is going to be, well, not also, but it's going to be responsible for muscle tone and movements in the head, neck, and in the proximal limbs. And so it's these three pathways are going to be involved. The reticular spinal, tectospinal, and the vestibular spinal. And this is what those are responsible for. Okay, so the reticular spinal, remember, has to do, right, with this structure here, the reticular formation. That was that structure that was responsible for awareness but since we're talking about motor right it has to do with muscle tone so this one here is going to help with reflexes that involve both posture and balance the tectospinal we're familiar with the superior and inferior colliculi number of the corpora quadrumina the superior has to do with visual reflexes and then the inferior has to do with auditory reflexes Superior helps with tracking movements from side to side. The inferior has to do with auditory movement, or not movement, but from auditory stimuli, like someone calling your name and you turn it around. And then finally, the vestibular spinal has to do with vestibular system there, but that helps with maintenance of balance when you're sitting, standing, and walking. Okay. So first clinical view, treating spinal cord injuries. So depending on the severity of a spinal cord injury is going to determine whether or not an individual is able to feel certain sensations or be able to move their body. Okay, either they're going to be paralyzed or they're going to be numb and they won't be able to feel certain sensations there. So um, usually what they try to do if someone suffers a spinal cord injury is the, the first thing is, is to reduce inflammation because central nervous system neurons cannot regenerate. Peripheral nervous system uh, neurons can regenerate up to a certain point depending on the extent of the damage. But central nervous system neurons uh, cannot. So scar tissue formation will occur from glial cell inter interference, and that will cause loss of function for those neurons there. It's a problem that we have to deal with. But 
one of the things that we've seen that if we can get the inflammation down initially as quickly as possible, recovery is much more likely and you'll have fewer or less serious effects from whatever that trauma was. Steroids are great. They're actually, they help with inflammation. They started using, I I mean, I'm not sure if they still use this this, um, uh, procedure. It's where... Um, I was, uh, one of the football players for the Buffalo Bills suffered a, a spinal cord injury on the field. They immediately took him to the hospital and they used on him uh, cold, ice cold saline. I don't remember what the temperature was, but it was very, very cold saline. Saline is, is pretty, pretty sterile. So they actually flushed that saline throughout his spinal column. And that helped to significant, it's like icing, you know, like you sprain your ankle and you ice your ankle, it helps reduce the swelling. Well, essentially what they did was they just bathed this guy's spinal cord in that ice cold saline there, helped to reduce the the, uh, the inflammation there. Of course, you're going to give him some other medications like antibiotics to fight off possible infections. Um, he never played football again, but the guy was walking. So he wasn't permanently paralyzed there. And of course, you know, he had some motor deficits, you know, he wasn't going to be able to, to, you know, like do hurdles or anything like that, but he was able to walk, all right, and be able to move his limbs, which is huge, which is huge, right? So we're looking into the use of neural stem cells because stem cell therapy uh, helps with regeneration and replacement of tissue there that's damaged. But again, that's, it's, it's, some of those treatments are not legal in the United States. So that should look familiar to y'all. Spinal nerve branches. Right, if you recall, remember, we have the different branches of the spinal nerves. You know, you have your spinal nerve that comes out, out of the spinal column here, out through the, um, the IVF, the intervertebral foramen, and it gives off this little small branch, which is known as the dorsal ramus that innervates deep muscles of the back and the skin on your back. And then at that point, you're left with the ventral or anterior ramus, which is going to, in some cases, like if we're in the thoracic spine, all right, it's going to help, it's going to contribute to the intercostal nerves. If you're up in the neck, it can contribute to plexes like the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus. If we're down in the, in the lumbar or sacral region of the spinal cord, the anterior ramus will contribute to the sacral and lumbar plexuses down there. Right. Then you'll see these two small branches coming off, and those are the rami communicans or rami communicantes, which are going to be on and off ramps onto that sympathetic chain right? that runs on either side of your vertebral column. This should all be reviewed for you. So again, we've talked about the dermatomes. I talked about this in lab, just a quick review here. Right? When we talk about the dermatomes, it's a specific area of skin that is innervated by a sensory neuron. So it's going to get that sensory input information from those specific locations, right? This is the one where I was telling you, right? Where if you talk about the umbilicus around the, the, the belly button there, that's the T10 dermatome. This that awesome map that you can utilize around the nipple area there. It's around T4, right? back of your head, C2, all right? So the this map just kind of tells you, all right, which of those areas of skin are innervated by which spinal nerve, which helps, right, when you're trying to diagnose a certain condition, especially if it's related to the spinal column, specific spinal nerves, you know, like a disc herniation or whatnot, all right? This also gets involved with, remember that referred pain I was telling you about? And this is a situation in which you're going to get visceral sensory information taking the same pathway as somatic sensory information is going to be taking the pathway. That's that analogy that I talked about taking the same elevator, right? But having different information there. So you can often pick up certain types of visceral pain, right? Are going to be sent to a specific dermatome because they care, they, they share the same pathway there. All right. Anyone here ever heard of shingles? Everybody. Has anyone ever had shingles? You ever had it on your eye? No, I had okay. Yeah, I always ask that to someone that's had shingles because I hear it's very painful. But it's very painful regardless. Um, so shingles is actually 
uh, a reanimation of the uh, chickenpox virus, right? It's called varicella zoster. And here's the thing. If you've ever had chickenpox, whether you got the shot or you had it naturally, all right, the virus takes a nap inside of your body. And it likes to hang out in the dorsal root ganglion. That's where it stays. And every once in a while, it likes to make an appearance. It's like the Rolling Stones. They retire, then they come out and do another goodbye tour, and then they retire again, and they go away, right? So this is what shingles does. When, it become, when that virus becomes active again, it is actually going to affect, because it lives in that dorsal root ganglion, it's going to affect all of those neurons along that dermatome there. So you'll see it on people. If they get it on their back, it's easy to see, right? Because you pull up their shirt and you'll look and it's along, it's along these pathways here. So you'll see them in a line here. And you said you had it on the side of your face? Yeah, my All right, so it might've gotten in now on the, more on the front. So that was trigeminal. All right, so it jumped onto the trigeminal there, right? Because C2 is on the back there. It may have been on C2, but most likely if it's on your forehead, that's trigeminal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's trigeminal. So, anyways, it will move. It's so you get all the symptoms, painful rash, blisters, and all that. Okay. Yeah. So you'll get it right along that dermatome there. Now, of course, you know, there's you give antivirals, steroids, and some of the more extreme cases. I had a patient that she was on steroids for six months. She had a really bad one, right? But they'll have all right, significant pain, anywhere from burning and tingling sensation there. They say that the vaccine ha will uh, reduce the severity. We are seeing data now, though, that people that have gotten the chickenpox vaccine uh, have a higher likelihood of getting shingles later on in their life. So I'm not saying don't get the chickenpox vaccine. I'm not going to tell anybody not to do that. All right. But we're just seeing some data out there with some correlation there. Now, you can go and get the sh shingle shot. Right. And again, it helps with that. But at the same time. I'm just, I'm here to teach. I'm here to inform. All right, let's talk about reflexes here. So we're going to see, and especially this is a good time to, to, to kind of point out this class or this course, you're not going to, at the latter end of the course, that's when we're really going to be talking about some of the reflexes. But when you get into 211, you're going to, we're going to start talking about more so autonomic reflexes. So that's why it's really important. I always tell folks, Pay attention to what I'm going to be, well, always pay attention to what I'm talking about, all right? But really pay attention to this because it's going to, you're going to revisit it when you take 211. So it's really a, a good opportunity. Um, so reflexes are one, rapid. They're pre-programmed. So it means it's going to happen the same way every time, right? Involuntary responses, thank God, all right? Because it would really suck that if you had to, if you touch something hot and that you actually had to think about pulling your hand away. It's nice that it's involuntary and that you automatically pull your hand away, right? So we talk about rapid, pre-programmed, involuntary responses to, our, uh, excuse me, of our effectors, which are muscles or glands, but here's the important thing, to a stimulus. So essentially, you need, and this is very important, and I've, I've asked questions on this before too, you need a stimulus in order to have a reflex. Does that make sense? You have to have a stimulus, if there's no stimulus and the, the receptor isn't going to be triggered. And so you're not going to evoke any type of reflex there. And so one of the characteristics, like I said, is rapid. So the fewer neurons that are in that chain, the quicker the reflex. So, because remember I told you that the synapse is where, right, things slow down. Because remember that whole process that occurs at a synapse you have to convert that act potential into chemical signal. Then you got to wait for the diffusion of the neurotransmitter across the synaptic clefts, right? And then it's got to generate another act potential in the postsynaptic neuron. So the fewer neurons you have, the more rapid the reflex will be. Always the same. So it's pre-programmed and it's involuntary, right? And a lot of times people don't even know they did the reflex until after it happened. So a lot of these reflexes are for survival. Perfect example, all right? If you've ever had a child or you know somebody that's had a child and they're nursing, breastfeeding there, 
There's a reflex that the baby does when it's hungry. Does anyone know what reflex that is? It begins with an R. The rooting reflex. So you could do it easily. You just stroke the baby's cheek and they'll start to look towards where it is, all right, where you were stroking them. And that's a survival mechanism so they can feed, so they can eat, so they don't die, all right? So that's the rooting reflex. So a lot of these reflexes are based on survival mechanisms to keep us from harm. I mean, obviously the withdrawal reflex, you touch something that's hot or dangerous and you pull your hand away, okay? That is meant to protect you, all right? So keep that in mind as we go through this chapter here and talking about a few things. This, this slide is really a, a good slide. It shows you the reflex arc. It's got all the components to what a reflex is. Here you can see there's the stimulus. And in this case, it's showing this nail or pin here, right? That's penetrated the skin. It's stimulated nociceptors, which are pain receptors. And so that pain information travels on our somatic sensory neuron here. So that sensory neuron goes into the spinal cord, right? And then it synapses, in this case, onto an interneuron. The interneuron then will stimulate the motor neuron sending out that motor output information to the effector, which is normally going to be a flexor muscle, okay? Because it, you want to withdraw from something, you want to hit the flexor group there. And so the biceps brachii in this example contracts and pulls, all right, the hand away, all right, from something that's hot, or in this case, maybe that nail is poking out of a wall or something. All right, so you have those components, stimulus. You've got your receptor that monitors that stimulus. That receptor sends sensory input information to our control center here, central nervous system. That sensory, excuse me, that control center analyzes, interprets that sensory information and then determines what type of outcome it's going to engage in. And in this case, it's gonna stimulate, right, this motor neuron that goes to our effector organ, which in this case is skeletal muscle, to withdraw. So that's what we're seeing here. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna come back to that. Where's my slide? Oh, I thought I had it on here. Well, I don't, all right, not to worry. It has all these parts here and pieces to it. So make sure you know all of those components, right? When we talk about a reflex arc, so look at the different types of reflexes here. When we're, when we're talking about classifying our spinal reflexes, right, or just reflexes in general, we have spinal or cranial. So obviously, if it's a spinal reflex, right, we might not even need to involve the brain as our control center, which is what you just saw on the previous page there. If it's a cranial reflex, we will. Right? Somatic or visceral, we're going to be talking about somatic in this chapter. But visceral, you're going to see lots of visceral reflexes in 211. Salivation, that's a reflex. You smell something, it makes you hungry, you start to salivate. That's a visceral reflex. Okay, the stimulus was that scent that you smelled there. All right, so somatic means the effector is going to be skeletal muscle. Visceral means the effector is going to be either smooth, cardiac, or a gland. Our reflexes can be monosynaptic, which means that you have one synapse involved in the whole reflex arc. So it's literally a sensory neuron that synapses onto a motor neuron. And then you're gonna have polysynaptic, which means you're gonna have two or more, which means you're gonna have a sensory neuron and then an inner neuron, quite possibly another inner neuron, but you'll have at least an inner neuron in there. So you'll have at least two synapses. Ipsilateral, contralateral. If it's ipsilateral, that means the stimulus occurred on this and the effect occur on the same side of the body. If it's contralateral, that means the stimulus is on one side and the effect is on the opposite. And then finally, you have innate and acquired. Innate's what you're, what you're born with. Okay, like the Babinski reflex in babies, that's, that's, that's a reflex for them. That rooting reflex that I was just telling you about. Those are innate reflexes there. Acquired is what you're going to develop as you age, as you grow. All right, so those are the different ways that we can classify those reflexes here. So this slide here is showing you the difference between a monosynaptic reflex, like I said, 
sensory neuron synapses directly onto the motor neuron, and then the motor neuron is going to stimulate the effector. And then our polysynaptic, you're going to have at least one inner neuron in between, which is faster. Is the monosynaptic faster or the polysynaptic faster? Monosynaptic. One synapse versus two synapses. That means we have to release neurotransmitter twice, and that's going to slow us down. Okay, so we're going to do, if we have time, um, we won't have time to finish all of them. We have, well, I'm going to try to get through one or two of them, of the spinal reflexes here. And I actually talked to you a little bit about the first spinal reflex, which was the stretch reflex, when I showed you the patellar hammer one, when I hit you in the knee, okay? So with our spinal reflexes, the four that we're going to go over versus the stretch, Okay, so if a muscle start, if it starts to get overstretched, we're going to initiate this reflex. You have the Golgi tendon reflex. What happens now when a muscle contracts too much? We don't want to cause any damage from over contraction. Then we have the withdrawal reflex. We can all, I've mentioned that a couple times. Painful stimulus, you pull away. And then the crossed extensor reflex. This is the one where I was telling you about when you're walking around at night and you step on your kid's Lego, all right, and you pull your your leg away from the Lego, but the other leg is going to stay stiff so you don't fall over, All right, But we'll go through these. All right, so the first two, the stretch and the Golgi, All right, rely on our proprioceptors. And so we're gonna discuss what a muscle spindle is, all right? That's the proprioceptor, and I'll show you what it looks like here. I'll come right back. This is our muscle spindle. It's almost like a muscle inside of a muscle. Okay, so this little area of muscle is going to have all right these structures, these appendages that wrap around all right those muscle fibers there, and so they monitor what's going on with that muscle fiber. That's what that muscle spindle is, right? So we talk about these intrafusal muscle fibers that are wrapped around right with these uh, receptors there that determine what's going on with what's happening with that muscle there, All right? So the intrafusal muscle fibers are going to be innervated by gamma motor neurons. And then we wrap them up with our sensory neurons so we know what's happening with those muscle fibers. Are they contracting too much? Are they stretching too much? Then the fibers that are, aren't in that spindle, All right, that would be these guys outside, all right, those are going to be innervated. All right, those are called the extrafusal because they're on the outside. They're going to be innervated. This is very important. Large alpha motor neurons. Gamma motor neurons are smaller than alpha motor neurons. Alpha motor neurons are the largest. What's what was that? Who cares? Big deal. What's the significance of the size of a, of, of a neuron? Y'all remember? Two things affect the conduction velocity of an action potential. What is one of them? The what? Not the blood vessels. Something to do with the type of conduction that goes on. Myelin, myelinated, okay, remember? What we said, if a nerve is myelinated, it conducts action potentials faster. And the other is diameter, how big. I know what you're thinking though. Yeah, how big, okay? More water can go through a bigger pipe than a smaller pipe, okay? So that's what we're gonna see. Alpha motor neurons are larger, larger diameter. That means they can conduct action potentials quicker. This is important when we get to neuron. I mean, when we get to reflexes, you want fast, fast, rapid, all right, action potentials there. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to stretch this muscle. So we start to stretch it, starts to stretch it, and then it starts to send out through the proprioceptors sensory information. It's like, all right, I'm getting stretched, I'm getting stretched, ho, oh, and I and it keeps getting stretched. Now you're overstretching me, right? This isn't good, right? So we're going to send that information that's stretching information here to the spinal cord. That's what you're seeing here. 
right? So these intrafusal muscle fibers are getting stretched and they start to get stretched past the, the comfort zone here. And then the gamma motor neurons are going to send that information right up to, no, no, not the gamma motor neurons, strike that. The sensory neurons are going to send that sensory proprioceptive information to our control center here in our um, spinal cord there. So as this thing becomes overstretched, what you're going to see is those sensory neurons are going to synapse onto our motor neurons. We saw this before here. Let me zoom in. Right. Follow the pathway here. All right. So our sensory neurons, the blue neurons here that are surrounding the intrafusal muscle fibers here, this is getting stretched too much. They start to send that sensory information here, all right, through the sensory neuron into our spinal cord. And so you're going to see here, all right, two possibilities. You're going to see here this sensory neuron synapsing onto this inner neuron, and it is then going to stimulate this alpha motor neuron to contract that muscle, whatever that muscle is that's being stretched, the one here in our example, you can see down here, right? That muscle that's getting uh, stretched too much here is the, by, excuse me, is the triceps brachii. So if you're flexing your elbow and you keep flexing and flexing it, I don't know how much you can flex your elbow past the point of 150 uh, degrees, but you somehow do. And it starts to overstretch that triceps muscle. Well, to prevent that triceps muscle from tearing, we're going to start to contract that muscle by the use of the alpha motor neurons stimulating that muscle. We're at the same time, though, all right, we need to inhibit the antagonistic muscle, which is the biceps brachii. So that's what you're going to see in our stretch reflex. We walk you through. All right, so the muscle's getting stretched. The sensory neurons are going to be sending those impulses, that information to the spinal cord. And so what will happen is the spinal cord will then stimulate the alpha motor neurons to the muscle that's being overstretched to start to contract. And it's monosynaptic, so it's going to be fast, really fast. So when that muscle starts to contract, it's not going to be stretched anymore. So we stopped that. But in order to make sure that we do not have that tricep to get, getting stretched, right, we need to take out the antagonistic muscle. So at the same time, right, that sensory neuron is going to synapse onto an inner neuron Again, and that inner neuron has to synapse onto an alpha motor neuron. So that's going to be slightly longer there, right? And it is going to inhibit the antagonistic muscle. We call this phenomena reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal inhibition. That's what you're seeing here in this picture. So our sensory neuron comes in. Right, it directly synapses onto the alpha motor neuron that innervates the same muscle that's getting overstretched. So it causes it to contract, so we stop the stretch. At the same time, that same sensory neuron is going to synapse onto an inner neuron, which then synapses onto an alpha motor neuron that travels to the antagonistic muscle, in this case, the biceps brachii. So you'll see this negative sign there. So it's going to inhibit this motor neuron so this muscle is unable to contract. Because what happens if you contract both the muscles at the same time? If you contract two antagonistic muscles, what's going to happen? Nothing. There's not going to be any movement. So you don't want to work against yourself. You want to inhibit the antagonistic muscle so you can contract, right? So you can stop the stretching there of the triceps brachii in this case. All right, that's the stretch reflex. Real quick, let's do the tendon uh, reflex or the Golgi tendon reflex. All right, 
So the, the, the tendon reflex here, again, its purpose is to prevent the opposite from happening. We want to make sure that we don't over contract the muscle in this case now. So we're going to have to shut something down. So again, in the, in these tissues here, you're going to have these sensory receptors called Golgi tendon organs. And so those are proprioceptors and they're going to be found where the muscle and the tendon start to transition into one another. So we call that the muscle tendon junction there. Similar type of situation that we just saw on the previous slide there, right? So those sensory axons are being stimulated because you're over contracting that muscle. And so they're going to then do something completely opposite. We just saw reciprocal inhibition in the previous example. Now we're gonna see something called reciprocal activation. So we're gonna shut down the muscle that's, over, that's overly contracting in this case, right? So these sensory neurons, all right, are gonna stimulate the inner neurons that inhibit the motor neurons that go to the muscle that's over contracting. But at the same time, we're gonna stimulate the antagonistic muscle group and cause that muscle to contract it's because if the biceps muscle is over contracting i i'm going to shut this muscle off and then i'm going to activate my triceps brachii muscle and make that contract because guess what that's going to do it's going to extend the elbow it's going to stretch the biceps brachii preventing it from being over contracted here let me show you <clears throat> all right in this situation we're going to be seeing Right, our hamstrings and our quadriceps muscle. All right, so here you can see there's the Golgi tendon organ, right in the the tendon the muscle tendon junction site here. All right, so now this muscle is getting over contracted. So the sensory neurons send sensory input information here into the control center, i.e., our spinal cord. And so what we're going to see here on the left side, this sensory neuron is going to cause the inner neuron to create inhibition of the alpha motor neuron that's going to the muscle that's being over contracted here. In this case, in our example, it's the quadriceps muscle. So the quadriceps muscle was contracting too much. We're going to shut that down. But at the same time, we're going to stimulate right? The antagonistic muscle or the antagonist muscle, the hamstrings. So that sensory neuron will then activate the inner neuron and that inner neuron will then stimulate the alpha motor neuron that goes to the hamstrings and it causes the hamstrings, right, to actually contract so we can lengthen out the quadriceps femoris muscle because it was overly contracting there. So by doing that, that process, we call that reciprocal activation. So in this example, the muscle that was overly contracting, we shut it off and then we uh, activate its antagonist in our example, which happened to be the hamstrings so we can lengthen the muscle that was contracting too much. All right, that's the tendon reflex or the Golgi tendon reflex. Okay, let's stop here.